So this morning we're going to be talking about John 18, 12 through 27. And if you don't have a Bible with you, you can use the Bible that's in the pew. It should be on page 400, I mean 904 in the pew Bibles. So this is the Word of God in chapter 18 of John, starting at the 12th verse. So the band of soldiers and their captain and the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him. First, they led him to Annas, for he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was high priest that year. It was Caiaphas who had advised the Jews that it would be expedient that one man should die for the people. Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did another disciple. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he entered with Jesus into the court of the high priest. But Peter stood outside the door. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out and spoke to the servant girl who kept watch at the door and brought Peter in. The servant girl at the door said to Peter, You also are not one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Now the servants and the officers had made a charcoal fire because it was cold, and they were standing and warming themselves. Peter also was with them, standing and warming himself. The high priest then questioned Jesus about his disciples and his teaching. Jesus answered, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in synagogues and in the temple where all the Jews come together. I have said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who have heard me what I said to them. They know what I said. When he had said these things, one of the officers standing by struck Jesus with his hand, saying, Is that how you answer the high priest? Jesus answered him, If what I said is wrong, bear witness about the wrong. But if what I said is right, why do you strike me? Annas then sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Heavenly Father, Almighty God, Father of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, we lift up praise to you as we worship this morning. You are worthy of all honor and power and glory. Lord, open our eyes, our hearts, and our minds to receive understanding, knowledge, and comfort from your holy word. Lord, you know us better than we know ourselves, and yet you still love us. Before the beginning of the world, you set your loving kindness on us, and it is without limit, lasting throughout our lives in this world and on into eternity. Father, protect us from the evil one and from ourselves at times. Guide us in the path of righteousness and when we fall, we pray that you would be quick to pick us up, brush us off, and put us back into the battle. You are our shield, our strength, and our protector. We love you, Lord. There is none like you. May we revere and exalt your name now and forevermore. Amen. So today, we're going to be looking at John 18, 12 through 27, but we're also going to be looking into uh, Luke, who will expand some of what we know about this particular uh, instance. If you have a note uh, sheet in your bulletin, which I hope you do, it says it's trials and tribulations. That's what the name of the sermon is. First point is the interrogation and betrayal, and the way we'll do it is we clear through uh, John 18, 12 through 27. And then point two, the foretelling is where we go to Luke and see how Luke expands and gives us insight that we don't have from just the one uh, account. In three, we'll talk a little bit about perseverance and preservation. And then purpose, uh, number four, purpose and predestination. My wife asked me, are you trying to alliterate? 
No, I wasn't trying. It just works out that way today. So let's, let's begin with this. It's the first point. The interrogation and the betrayal. On a cold night in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus was bound and taken away by the very people who would later crucify him. All of his disciples ran away and abandoned him. Later, two disciples, Peter and another unnamed disciple, went to the place where he had been taken to. Jesus' hour had come. In these verses, 12 to 27, the story of Jesus' arrest and interrogation is interwoven with Peter's betrayal. It's almost cinematic in its own way. The scenes switch back and forth between Jesus and Peter. The calm, steadfast Lord of glory, abused and mocked. The grieving and fearful and sorrowful disciple. A story that humbles us, I think, in every way. So let's look at this verse by verse. Verse 12 says, So the band of soldiers and their captain and the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him. A band of soldiers, as Peter, as uh, Pastor Kevin had told us last Sunday, was a very large band that came to, to arrest uh, Jesus. The temple police came, everybody was there, and they came for Jesus. John says that they arrested Jesus and bound him. They bound Jesus. What were they thinking? Right? These are the same guys that in 186, uh, chapter 18 and verse 6, when Jesus had said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell on the ground. They pulled themselves together and got up, and Jesus asked them again, Whom do you seek? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus answered, I told you, I am he. And then he commands them, So, if you seek me, let these men go. And they complied. And then they bound Jesus. Then Peter takes out a sword and cuts off Malchus' ear. And Jesus then heals him. You would think, after all of this that had gone on, that these, this band of soldiers would just pack it up and go home. But as much as they may have wanted to, they were Roman soldiers. And they knew that if they failed to carry out an order, that they could be stoned or beaten to death by their fellow soldiers in front of the assembled troops. So even after all they had seen and all that they had experienced, they arrested Jesus and bound him. Verse 13 says, First they led him to Annas, for he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was high priest that year. It was Caiaphas who had advised the Jews that it would be expedient that one man should die for the people. Why they took Jesus to Annas' home and then on to Caiaphas is somewhat uncertain. It could have been that the, the Jews considered that Annas was the true high priest because the Romans had deposed him from being that and put his son-in-law Caiaphas into his office. And, it turns out, only only the high priest can turn over Jesus to the Romans. Caiaphas, in his self-serving advice of 1115, was, it is better for you that one man should die for the people, not that the whole nation should perish. It's very unlikely, I think, that Caiaphas really cared about the people as much as he cared about his power. In 15... Simon Peter follows, followed Jesus and also did another disciple. Since that disciple was unknown to the high priest, he entered with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. Peter and the other disciple, who was probably John, followed him at a distance. The other disciple had some connection with the high priest. He could have been a former student of the high priest, uh, or maybe he was just supplying fish to the high priest's household. The other disciple was allowed to come through the courtyard with Jesus. In verse 16 it says, But Jesus stood outside at the, I mean, but Peter stood outside at the door, so that the other disciple 
who was known to the high priest, went out and spoke to the servant girl who kept watch at the door and brought Peter in. So Peter just he couldn't get in until the other disciple had talked to the servant girl. Now, she was kind of an unlikely guardian of the door, but the high priest was apparently not expecting any trouble. So he had no doubt believed that he was in complete control. In verse 17, the servant girl at the door said to Peter, you also are not one of this man's disciples, are you? This is Peter's first denial. He is questioned by a little servant girl and he folds. Peter's life as an apostle had high highs and low lows. He seemed to be, as Winston Churchill once quipped, a riddle wrapped in a mystery inside an enigma. As we look back on Peter's life, we see that he had seen and done amazing things, but he had also done a number of perplexing things that just leave us bewildered. Simon met Jesus, and his brother is the one who introduced him to Jesus. His brother had been a follower of John the Baptist. And so from that time on, Simon would see and experience just miraculous things. Like the time when Peter and Andrew were fishing on the Sea of Galilee, Jesus saw them and asked them to follow him. He was choosing them to become disciples. Luke also records that Simon and his crew had been out <coughs> fishing. And Simon tells Jesus that they've been out all night and with no success. Jesus tells Simon to cast his nets, and he did as he was told, and they caught a great number of fish. When Simon saw that miracle, he fell down at Jesus' knees, crying, Depart from me, I am a sinful man, O Lord. In the light of Jesus' presence, Simon sees that he's a sinner. But Jesus doesn't depart from him. Instead, he adds another name. He says he's going to be called Peter, or Petros, Cephas, the rock. Not long after that, Jesus visits Peter's house, and Peter sees Jesus cure his sick mother-in-law. And then later, Peter becomes one of the eyewitnesses to a miracle that Jesus performed where he raised a little girl back from the dead. So many astonishing things had happened in such a short period of time. Back in our text, we find Peter in a much different circumstance. In verse 18, it says, Now the servants and officers had made a charcoal fire because it was cold, and they were standing and warming themselves. Peter also was with them, standing and warming himself. So what must have been going through his mind at that time, as he stood there waiting to see what was going to happen to Jesus? The scene now switches to Jesus' interrogation. In verses 19 and 20, it says, The high priest then questioned Jesus about his disciples and his teaching. Jesus answered him, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in synagogues and in the temple where the Jews come together. I have said nothing in secret. As Jesus was being questioned, he continued to protect his disciples. He refers to what he said as, I have spoken, I have taught, I have said. In the garden, he had commanded that these, he had commanded that these men would not be taken. They would all have their hour, but this was Jesus' hour. And in verse 21, it says, Why do you ask me? Ask those who have heard me what I said to them. They know what I said. This was a mock trial. It didn't follow the rules that are, or the procedures that were customary for the Jews. The person on trial, if they were doing this in their customary way, would never be required to testify or answer questions. Witnesses both for and against the accused had to be called. The first to speak would be those who were testifying to the integrity of the person on trial, and then the witnesses against the accused could speak. Jesus is saying, you are not following uh, your own law. Where are my witnesses? In verse 22, 
when he had said these things, one of the officers standing by struck Jesus with his hand, saying, Is that how you answer the high priest? Jesus answered him, If what I said is wrong, bear witness about the wrong. But if what I said is right, why do you strike me? Annas then sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. This guy, this officer, slapped the face of the Lord of glory. Does the thought of it make you cringe? Jewish law said that an accused person could not be harmed in any way unless or until it was found to be guilty. It was an other miscarriage of their own law, and Jesus called them on it. Up to the time he was arrested, no one could lay a harmful hand on him. This was the beginning of his physical torment, this slap was. And it would escalate and escalate, and at last he would die on a cross. Verse 25 says, Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. So they said to him, You also are not one of his disciples, are you? And he denied it and said, I am not. Again, Peter disavows the Lord. What anguish he must have been in as he remembers his time with Jesus. He had to remember Jesus walking on the water and Jesus commanding him to come to him. He tried to walk on the water, and for a moment, he did. But his faith wavered, and Jesus saved him. Or how painful it must have been to remember the time that he proclaimed that Jesus was the Christ. He said that Jesus was the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And then... When he had heard Jesus tell the disciples how much he was going to suffer, suffer, Peter took Jesus aside and rebuked him, telling the Lord, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall never happen to you. And how Jesus had turned to him and said, Get behind me, Satan, you are a hindrance to me, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. And how could he ever forget this? The time when he was with James and John and they witnessed the transfiguration of Jesus and the appearance of Moses and Elijah on a mountain and heard the voice of God. And then Peter offered to make little shelters for them. You just couldn't tell what Peter was going to say. In verse 26, it says, one of the servants of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, Did I not see you in the garden with him? Peter again denied it, and at once a rooster crowed. This man who had seen miracles and lived and traveled with Christ for three years denied his Lord a third and last time, just as Jesus predicted he would. One of the uh, beauties and the blessings of having four books of the gospel available to us is that they enrich and support one another. They give different perspectives that help us understand and appreciate even more fully the mission of Christ and the mission of the 11 disciples. So this in your notes is number two, the foretelling. And we're going into Luke for that. The account of Jesus' foretelling of Peter's denial in Luke 22, 31 helps us to better understand Peter and what was about to happen in his life. Let me first read this passage in one piece and then we can look at it more closely. It starts off in 31. It says, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you that he might sift you like wheat. But I've prayed for you that your faith may not fail, and when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. Peter said to him, Lord, I am ready to go with you both to prison and to death. And Jesus said, I tell you, Peter, the rooster will not crow this day until you deny me three times that you know me. Twice, 
the Lord used his name twice. Simon, Simon. It's a literary construction among the Jews that when a personal name is repeated consecutively, it shows that the person addressed is someone that the speaker has a deep affection for. And Jesus did have a deep affection for him. He loved his disciple. But at that moment, Simon was Simon loved of the Lord and not Simon and not Peter, the rock. Peter is told that the devil demanded to have him. Demanded to have him. Charles Spurgeon says, Peter was to be sifted, so our Lord warned him, and Satan was to operate with the sieve. Satan had an intense desire to destroy Peter. Indeed, he would like to destroy all the chosen of God. And therefore, he desired to sift him as wheat in a hope that he would be blown away with the husks and the chaff. He was anxious to get to Peter, into, get Peter into his clutches, to give him as tremendous a shaking as he could imagine. Peter, just after hearing these words, above, he said, I'm ready to go with you both to prison and to death. And his words were prophetic. It was to come to pass that at the appointed time Peter would indeed go to prison and to death for his Lord. It's reminiscent of the account of Satan confronting God about Job. Satan wanted Job as he would want Peter centuries later. Satan says, tells God, just let me have him. Just let me get at him. In Job 1, 11 through 12, starts... This is Satan speaking. But stretch out your hand and touch all that he has, and he will curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your hand. Only against him do not stretch out your hand. So Satan went out from the presence of God. Satan is the ultimate villain in every story. The accuser and the destroyer. Only those who are in God's hand survive an account with him. Like, G like Judas, who also had experience with Satan, but it wasn't a confrontation, it was a collaboration. In Luke 22, 3-6, it says, Then Satan entered into Judas, called Iscariot, who was of the number of the twelve, he went away and conferred with the chief priests and officers how he might betray him to them. And they were glad and they agreed to give him money. So he consented and sought an opportunity to betray him to them in the absence of a crowd. Peter, Judas, they were both sinners. Peter, one of the elect, given to Christ by the Father, and Judas, used by God, as was Pharaoh in the account in Romans where it says, for the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose I have raised you up that I might show my power in you and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. When Satan demands to have Peter, Jesus, the all-loving all-powerful Lord of glory, confronts the devil with his prayer to the Father. Who do you think would win? Jesus said in John 17, 12, While I was with them, I kept them in your name, which you have given me. I have guarded them, and not one of them has been lost, except the son of destruction, that the scripture might be fulfilled. Jesus knew that he would bring Peter back, and that Peter would become a leader and a faithful preacher of the gospel. Peter's third denial in Luke 22, 60 through 62 is just heartrending. It's touching how he could have done what he did and yet it is tearing him apart. He is in anguish. In Peter, uh, in 60, verse 60, it says, Peter said, Man, I do not know what you are talking about. And immediately, while he was speaking, the rooster crowed. And the Lord 
turned and looked at Peter. Nowhere else in the New Testament does it mention this, just here. He turned and he looked at Peter. And Peter remembered the saying of the Lord, how he had said to him, before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. And in 62 it says, and he went out and wept bitterly. When he looked back at Jesus, Peter's eyes had to be filled with shame and anguish. But what do you think Jesus' expression was when he looked at Peter? Does Jesus look at Peter with eyes filled with anger or disgust or, ex or exasperation? Or was it an expression of love for a man that he loved and had betrayed him? but that he was never let, going to let go of. He was going to lay down his life for Peter and for all those the Father had given him and would be giving him. So why is this story recorded in all four Gospels? It seems that it was very important to the writers that it be included in the Gospels. And it's important for us today the narrative here for Jesus is about the hatred and the, of sinful men against a loving God. But for Peter, it's a story of the struggle of faith in the heart of one of God's elected. But out of the 11, why Peter? Was he more important or, or just one of the disciples? He was certainly outspoken. He was the spokesman of the disciples. He was quick to speak and quick to act. He had ups and downs, moments of strong faith and weak faith, moments of overconfidence and of complete inability, moments of pride and moments of humility. But why Peter? Why do we get to read so much about him? Maybe because in him we see ourselves. We may not be the extrovert that Peter was, but we can still identify with him because we are also sinners saved by grace. We all have our ups and downs, but we are still gifts given by the Father to Christ, just like Peter. How can we, like Peter, maintain our salvation in spite of our predilection to sin? Truth is, we don't maintain our salvation. God does. In Philippians 1, 6, Paul says, He who has begun a good work in you will perfect it to the end. It is the promise of God that when he starts something in our souls, he intends to finish. The letter P in the acrostic tulip stands for perseverance of the saints, or as some people like R.C. Sproul like to say, the preservation of the saints. All those who have been chosen by the Father and given to Christ will persevere by the grace of God alone and be watched over and preserved by the grace of God alone. John chapter 10, 27 through 30 says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. No one, not even themselves, not even yourselves, can take them, take them out of the Father's hand Can a mortal man, by his own strength, by his rebelliousness, or even his weakness, thwart the eternal plan of God? It is an affront to God to deny his power and at the same time try to make man capable of having power which exceeds God's. We work in our salvation, not for our salvation. We have Faith granted by God and maintained by the Holy Spirit. 
The Heidelberg Catechism, question 21, asks, what is true faith? And the answer is, true faith involves knowledge of the Word of God, holding it to be true, and a hearty trust that what God has revealed is ours. R.C. Sproul says, my confidence in my preservation is not my ability to persevere. My confidence rests in the power of Christ to sustain me with his grace and by the power of his intercession. He is going to bring us safely home. Look at our example this morning. Peter fell, but he returned. Jesus knew that Peter would do so. He, know, he knew when he would do it, and he knew he would be restored. Peter was never taken from the Father's hand. His fall was for a season. Peter would go on to preach on the day of Pentecost, and 3,000 would come to faith. He would write two books in the Word of God. He would lead the church at Jerusalem. He would go on to preach and teach in Antioch and Rome, and finally, he would be martyred just as Jesus had foretold. Four, purpose and predestination. These are big, big subjects, and these are only a small bite this morning, but they are, they are central, central to the faith that we have. So in four, it says, what will we go on to do? God has laid out our futures. He has predestined that we will bring him glory. It is his plan and purpose to use every saint and sinner to give him glory through their lives and actions. Proverbs 16, 4 says, The Lord made everything for his, its purpose, even the wicked for the day of trouble. He will ensure that we will persevere and that we will be preserved, but not by, not like some precious artifact you're going to put on a shelf. No, he has a plan. He has predestined what will happen and we are going to be an active part of it. Predestination is a doctrine in, is a doctrine in Christian theology. It is the divine foreordaining of all that will happen. God does not just tell you what's going to happen. He makes it happen. The word of God is full of scriptures that address predestination and foreknowledge. Here are just six out of many, I mean many, scriptures talking about predestination. First Peter 1, 2 says, according to the foreknowledge of the Father in sanctification of the Spirit for obedience to Jesus Christ, for the sprinkling with his blood, may grace and peace be multiplied to you. First Peter 1, 20 says, he was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest manifest in the last times for the sake of you. In 2 Peter 3, 3, 9, it says, The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promises, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. And in Romans 8, 28, yeah, 28 through 30, it says, And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for the good, for those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. Ephesians one, four through five. Even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him, in love he predestined us for adoption to him as though as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will. And Second Timothy one nine, who saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus 
before the ages began. The subject of predestination is also taken up in the Westminster Shorter Catechism, which I'm sure some of the younger people know here. <laughs> Question seven, what are the decrees of God? Answer is that the decrees of God are his eternal purpose according to the counsel of his will by which and for his own glory he has foreordained everything that ever happens. Question eight asks, how does God carry out his decrees? Answer is God carries out his decrees in the works of creation and providence. And question 11, what are God's works of providence? The answer is, God's works of providence are his most holy, wise, and powerful acts of preserving and governing all his creatures and all of their actions. In the scripture we're looking at this morning, the account of that night when Jesus was taken away by those who would crucify him and how his loved disciple would deny him three times wasn't written 2,000 years ago. It was written before the beginning of time. That morning, when the cock crowed, Jesus went away to finish the mission his father had given him. He knew that despite the pain and the suffering, he would be victorious. He knew he would rise to glory. Peter went away that morning, weeping, broken, uncertain of what would happen. Would his three denials separate him forever from his Lord and Savior? Was he going to be cast out of his master's kingdom? When we think about this account, we can be tempted to think, what did Peter, what, what Peter did was just awful. I, I couldn't do that. I could never do that. It would be good for us to remember how Paul warned the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians. He says, now these things happened to them, the Israelites, as an example, but they were written down for our instruction on whom the end of the ages has come. Therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed, lest he falls. Just as Paul had warned the Corinthians by reminding them of what the Israelites had done, John reminds us, by way of Peter's denial, that we too are capable of falling. Not falling out of God's hand, but falling hard enough to weep like Peter did. R.C. Sproul says, True Christians can have radical and serious falls, but never total and final falls from, from grace. Sometimes we, out of fear or just simple inattention to our walk, cause us to fall. But in Proverbs it says, it's assured that the righteous falls seven times and rises again, but the wicked stumble in times of calamity. We have to be wise in knowing our limitations, but we have to be wiser still in our trust in God who has no limitations. Trials and tribulations will come, but we will be victorious. Not by our own power, but by the power of Christ. Peter denied the Lord three times, and later in John, he pledged his love to Jesus three times. Fallen, not lost. Broken, yet healed. Weak, but strengthened in Christ. Brothers and sisters, be humble in spirit and be brave in Christ. If you are knocked down, get up and continue to run the race. Love one another. Share the simple gospel of our Lord with anyone who will listen. And if you are here today and you have not yet come to Christ, be awakened and come to your Savior. He is calling to you. Pray with me. Father God, we are forever grateful that you have called us to yourself through Jesus Christ our Lord. We rest not in our own strength, but in yours. We know that there will be times when we fail you when we are fearful, 
selfish or belligerent when we come up short of what we know we should be. But we also know that you will always be faithful and ready to correct us, strengthen us, heal us, and love us. You spared nothing when you sent your son to save us. And you know that he will hold us fast. May we say to him as Peter did, Yes, Lord, you know I love you. Amen.